So I normally expect to look in the audience and see the, the Don McCullen thousand yard stare. Um, so you can see that's, that was a small clip of one particular incident in Sungin uh, with a group of soldiers under siege. Um, and I defy anyone to go through anything like that without being deeply affected. The genesis of this project came as a result of a phone call. It's one of these things that a lot of these ideas emerged purely by, um, by, by opportunity and chance, right place at the right time. I had a phone call from the uh, sergeant medic at One Rifles over at Beachy Barracks, over in Chepstow, who happened to have an archaeology degree. And he rang me and said, we've got a soldier who's been off work for the best part of a couple of years, and we are running out of ideas as to what we can do with him. He happens to be a time team nut. Can we organize some archaeology for him and a group of chaps from One Rifles, 1st Battalion, um, just to get out onto one of their training areas and do something very, very different? Um, and that's how the project started. It perhaps shouldn't be a surprise that uh, eventually we've achieved quite a bit of success because a lot of the uh, archaeological techniques we've got in British archaeology, as you know, have emerged from a military sphere. And many of the great names in British archaeology have come from a military background or have gone into a military background. I'm sure if you look up and down the stairs here and see the uh, photographs of the great and the good, many of them will have been from a military background. Um, I'm probably doing the thing you shouldn't do with a PowerPoint in naming left to right, but you, you probably all can tell um, Lieutenant General Pitt Rivers, Brigadier Mortimer Wheeler, OGS Crawford, who of course developed his aerophotographic techniques in his days in the Royal Flying Corps before he joined the Ordnance Survey. And uh, with Leonard Woolley over on the right, T.E. Lawrence, who of course um, matched with the Crusader Castle. So there are all these great links to archaeology from the military. And of course, you can also think of the development of aerophoto photography, of metal detecting, all sorts of different pieces that join in with, with, with archaeology and military spheres. The first phase we did with soldiers was to get them into the idea of doing something very different, doing some archaeology, because lots of these chaps left school at 16. Lots of them weren't uh, ever told that they could do anything academic, um, and they probably, in many cases, not experienced anything other than soldiering. So this was a very, very different thing for them to do. They experienced Salisbury Plain, but perhaps not in a, in a, in a way of reverence as I have as an archaeologist. So the first thing we do with, with a lot of these projects is to inculcate them into the ideas of, of cultural heritage. Uh, we start with maybe a trip to the centre of Stonehenge, or in this case we went to the Iron Age village at, at Butzer, where we had them all uh, going around looking at Iron Age elements. They might experience it on the Iron Age sites we worked on. And of course they tried the hand of pottery, um, at the end of which I think I ended up with 25 ashtrays. <coughs> Apart from this one where uh, Rifleman Bernie put a, a hell of a lot of work into a, a replica Iron Age pot. Now I like this slide because I always show Wayne, uh, the soldier there, um, the image of him with all his tattoos and compare it with the Pazaric tattoos over in Siberia. And there's this very nice link of tattooed uh, warriors, for want of a better word, um, time immemorial. So they, they experience um, um, something very different. They're out in the open air and then we take them to an archaeological site and undertake some field work. With all the projects that we've worked on, we made sure that there's a very genuine work reason for it. I don't want to do job creation for these chaps, and I also don't want them on a site that they're going to do something that needn't be done. Um, we focus on things like heritage at risk. If there's a site that needs something doing to it, in terms of scrub clearance or recording, um, but I don't have the capacity uh, within my day job to do that, these chaps are the ideal um, solution. Um, if we have a site where the scheduling is very ropey, um, to say the least. Um, with scheduled monument clearance, we can then undertake a certain amount of limited evaluation to define the scheduling a little bit better. Um, we also try and improve some techniques of, of excavation, as I'll come to a little bit later. But there has to be a genuine work reason for this. So the first site we, we, we worked on, uh, for those of you that know Salisbury Plain, is the <coughs> East Chisholm Midden. It's a collection of feasting debris about three metres in depth, covering several hectares to, north, to the north of the military training area. It dates to about 700 BC, so that cusp between the late Bronze Age and the early Iron Age. Um, it's one of these sites that when you normally take school visitors over um, sites on Salisbury Plain, you encourage the children to kick over mole hills to see if they can find a piece of pottery. If you did that on the middle, you'd break your ankle. 
because there is that much material coming out. Burnt flint, um, animal bone, the odd piece of human bone, and uh, huge chunks of pottery. The first stage we did with these, uh, these, these chaps was to, to get them looking at the material coming out of it. It's not a scheduled monument. The main ravage, as you probably know, you'll never talk to an MOD archaeologist without them rattling on about badges, I'm afraid, so I'm going to meet the stereotype. Um, the biggest threat to monuments on Salisbury Plain um, are burrowing animals, rabbits and badgers. Uh, the midden is heavily affected by badgers who are turning out great um, volumes of archaeological deposits which are just lying on the surface. I thought it would be an ideal opportunity to get these individuals to plot, uh, map all the information, to learn using GPS and total station surveying equipment, skills that they can reuse when they have to go back into the army, um, to record the finds, to mark the finds, to wash the finds, and to do some desk based research as well. So material that's already out of context, but nonetheless would, would get me some extra information. Also, could they develop patterns of um, occupation and, and use of the middle, this big area, where different um, activities going on in different areas. So you can see the, the individuals here going through badger spoil. Um, Wiperman Singh on the right, holding up a, an Iron Age shirt. Uh, he was interviewed by the press about his feelings on the excavation project and its, its merits or otherwise. Um, and they asked him about what he'd enjoyed, and he said to be the first person to touch this piece of pottery in 2,700 years. It's got fingerprints on it as well. He had that real resonance that we have as archaeologists of connecting with one's ancestors with the past um, simply by seeing those fingerprints of the potter that had made it in the, in the early Iron Age. So he was, he was thrilled with that. We got them um, plotting every single find that they were getting from the midden um, using uh, finds tags to start with and then plotting with the surveying equipment that was provided by one of the engineering squadrons who were also getting a benefit from this because they normally have to survey their car park over and over and over and over again. So doing something very different was a good skill set for them and we tried to roll out within the Ministry of Defence where we can bring them in to use their laser scanning skills in a different capacity. We taught them also to um, draw sections, draw plans. Um, skills of surveying are very useful from an army perspective. So one of the things we've kept in our minds is that they've got to develop skills within this project that if they're retained as riflemen, they're able to use that knowledge as part of their day job. If they leave, it's a skill set or hopefully a bit of passion for archaeology and a new hobby that they can, they can utilize in city street. We started by plotting each individual find uh, until we found out that really doing that for about the best part of uh, 8,000 shares of pottery in a week is a very problematic methodology. So we taught them the way that you can adapt your research strategy through a process of excavation. The sorts of finds we had here were uh, rather nice Iron Age bowls, we've got all cannings, pottery bowls, we've got furrowed necks, vessels, um, a lot of animal bone, the sheep uh, with sheep form the largest portal assemblage component. Things like bone awls, um, some decorative pieces. The, the image in the bottom left, we have no idea what it is. Decorative fitting, we refer to it as, which means we don't really know. Um, three of those. And then one very small area, we had, I think it was 13 spindle wells. Um, when sheep are the dominant uh, formal assemblage to get a lot of uh, weaving uh, equipment which was quite interesting. We had a, a bit of a competition going on. One of the things you find when you mix various battalions together is that they become very competitive about what they find. Um, so first battalion is better than third. Six, how about sixth battalion? Eight. Sixth battalion are the best. Um, so very competitive. In this case we had um, inter-rank rivalry because we had a sergeant up against the Lance Corporal. The Lance Corporal found 13 spindle wells sergeant next to him found absolutely nothing. So by the end of the day, he was lucky he wasn't on a charge, being the lower rank. Anyway, um, large amount of material from spoil taken out by badgers, which would un otherwise have gone completely unrecorded. So for me, fabulous result. At the moment, all this material is at Beachy Barracks in Chepstow, where they're experiencing the joy of fines washing. Um, this was the chap that was put in charge of this. Um, so, um, the young rifleman, uh, rifleman being the lowest rank in the, in the Regiment. He was, uh, when I first met him, he was, he was a very, very quiet individual. Um, he was in a very, very special place. By the end of the week, we couldn't shut him up. Now, 
maybe that was a good thing, maybe that wasn't a good thing. Um, but he was very protective about his environment. Um, this was definitely his domain, the fines room, so much so that when we had the commander of the British Army, General Parker, turning up, he got barred from the fines tent by a rifleman, General Rifleman. Nonetheless, um, this rifleman had taken complete control and had organized this material. He'd um, taken the initiative of procuring um, lots of old excavation reports dealing with Paul Canning's cross pottery or uh, late bronze, early Iron Age pottery. So he was really developing that sort of desk-based skill that's fantastic for archaeologists, and he had it all very, very well organized, almost too organized. The project then moved from there um, to another site over in Wales. This is very close to the, uh, the barracks of the 1st Battalion of the Rifles over in Chepstow. This is on the Defence Training Estate Carl Wentz. So you'll notice we've given them all exercise names. This is the way we can book them onto the military training, uh, training authorities to say this is a unit specifically booking these sets of training features, it just happens to be for archaeology. Uh, so exercise Mars, this is a, a Roman site of Defence Training Estate Carl Wentz. As you probably all know, Carl Wentz is a very, very big Roman town and you have a lot of Roman military elements nearby. The site itself, um, within the training area, was horribly overgrown with um, trees and weeds. Although Cadu don't have a, um, a heritage at risk list, I'm sure that if they did, this potentially would have gone on to it. Um, so the first stage of the operation was to um, use strimmers and chainsaws to clear up a large area. And even if we'd done nothing else, the site would have been hugely improved as a result of that. Um, as with many of the sites on the Ministry of Defence area, they've been looked at um, in the past by antiquaries with not a great deal of recording going, it has to be said. The records for this site was simply a letter from one of the participants to the excavator some 30 years on saying, I do remember our lovely summer at Carwent, we had a good time at finding that broken material. Not great for the HER, I think we'll agree. Um, the scheduling of this site was simply a large duck egg around, a large oval, sorry, literally a large oval set on top of the map, and that's a scheduled area. Again, fantastic. So what the chaps did was to undertake geophysical survey along with one of the geophysicists at Cranfield uh, Military Academy, and after that what they did was to re-excavate the Antipodes trenches to record the sections that had never been recorded and to recover any material that had been missed. In so doing, they uncovered a really rather wonderful and very large Roman building, including um, very large laid ashlar blocks, hypercourse system, and in the spoil left by the Antipodes, I think they found about 20 Roman coins, including this rather special gate, which is um, quite nice in that you compare it with the sort of military gatehouse that they've got there on site and for their uh, military guard service. So it's, it's that nice connection. We find that uh, getting as many connections for the soldiers as possible keeps them, keeps them engaged. So very, very successful piece of work. Now, from maybe from the sublime to the ridiculous, the next site we worked on um, goes back to that idea of trying to improve techniques. And I know that uh, many of you that work in archaeology or follow archaeology will know that English Heritage at the moment are trying to revamp their guidance notes as to what one should do in recovering modern archaeology, 20th century archaeology, and that relating to that, uh, the Second World War. What you may not know is that the, the heritage statute connected with things like this air crash site is owned by the Ministry of Defence under the Protection of Military Remains Act that was issued in 1986. Every single crashed aircraft from the Second World War and many named wrecks are covered by this act. Therefore, you cannot simply go out into the field with a large JCB and dig a hole and recover it. Um, partly because if you dig up a bomber, you may not have dug it up after it's come back from its mission from Germany, and therefore it may still have the bombs on board. Uh, that's the same reason you don't want to dig it as you don't want to metal detect on Salisbury Plain. Very good reason for it. Liable to go and bang. Um, so the statute is organized, um, but issue, licenses are issued to individuals that want to recover crash site elements for a specific purpose, um, for commemoration or for including material within a specific museum, for example. For the most part, that's simply been a recovery operation. What we wanted to do as part of Operation Nightingale was to try to change techniques whereby you brought a more archaeological perspective to that work and recovered it using more traditional archaeological techniques. You're still using a JCB, which you'll see on archaeological sites anyway, but you want to plot finds, to have information um, derived from the, the work you're undertaking, to 
draw some sections, and to get most information you possibly can about the story of the last moments of this airframe. In this instance, this was a, um, a Sterling bomber that crashed in Lurgershall in Sussex. Um, it was a, a victim of friendly fire, um, brought down by a British aircraft, and it crashed at about 80 degrees to the horizontal, straight down, nosing down into the ground. And that's information we were able to derive from measuring and drawing sections of the uh, the engines and such like from uh, they were moving from the ground. And you can see two uh, two riflemen here recording the material that they're excavating and plotting it in surveys so that we're able to produce a scatter plot relating to the sterling, as you can see over there on the left. What was another interesting dynamic here is having military people excavating the military site because you have all the, uh, the ethos connectors there of people from the military background fully understanding the heritage importance of a site like this because effectively these are their forebears, their ancestors. One of the interesting um, elements we found from one of the chaps was that he'd been a machine gunner for the platoon out in Afghanistan and he found that one small uh, round case, a 303 case from the crash site and he picked this up, thing up and he was mulling over it as so though it was a, a really venerated object. Um, I asked him why he was looking specifically at this one particular piece of metal. And he said to me, what you can tell from this is the gunner um, has thought he's got home safely before he was shot down. Because the round has been pushed into the, into the gun, chambered, and then he's extracted it, as you do when you unload the gun to get home. And it's at that point that the aircraft's been hit. And he was only able to tell that because he was, that was his day job, he was a machine gunner. And he could tell all that from the little scratches on the edges of the, the, the rifle case, which is a very powerful little artifact, frankly. It's a moment of hope for the, the crewman just before, he, before he's hit. So that was a, a very poignant element of that piece of work. It's not all field work with this project. What we're trying to do is to build up partnerships with external companies to get these uh, individuals into professional organizations to continue um, their, their, their own learning, development, and getting different skills. So um, doing presentations such as, as Dave's doing with me today, or, or learning writing skills to write up the reports of what they've done. Um, lots of professional companies have been very good with their time and volunteering um, places for these, these people to go on two-week placements. We always have two individuals together, so they're, they're buddying up the devil on their own. Um, this is one example with Wessex Archaeology where two riflemen are learning to do um, finds recording, to draw the finds that they've made, um, and also to do some paleopathology. One of the one of the individuals you see here actually has to deal with that thing, uh, that sort of side of things when he goes in theatre and they, they um, uh, come across human remains. It's being able to do an initial forensic job. So for him, a very important piece of work. Canterbury Archaeological Trust also offered places and they were uh, good enough to put up about 12 riflemen who worked on the Roman site. Um, the star find being this rather lovely tableau on the, on the right, the Roman gemstone, which was found by a Corporal Steve Winston, the rifle. So for him, that's his archaeological career finished because he's never going to find anything ever as good as that. And they've worked alongside um, groups such as the Church's Conservation Trust as part of their Heritage Lottery funded um, survey of this church down in Portland and the soldiers worked alongside other volunteers using, using the total station to record the graveyard and the church itself. I mentioned heritage at risk, which we have uh, much too much on the MOD estate for my liking, but we're bringing it down. One of the uh, sites we've got out at uh, Otterburn, uh, it's called Battle Hill actually, in Walcott, um, is uh, a collection of cup and ring mark stones, and the reason they're on the heritage at risk list is because um, they get eroded through rain. Really, that's an act of God. Not a lot we can do in the Ministry of Defence about that. Um, but one of the things we could do is to illustrate to the inspectors of monuments that we are recording these things and getting an empirical data set together to monitor any erosion effects. And thereby, we are doing the best by the, the monument, and hopefully, we'll get it off the at-risk list. Perhaps we, may, we might we might cover it with the turf that you can see locally, or we will just simply continue the monitoring, monitoring process. But as I said to you before, the engineers involved in the project have this skill. They're able to use laser scanners, bringing that kit in that they usually use in theatre, but they can also equally apply it to an archaeological technique. So it's not surveying the car park, but it serves an actual proper um, purpose within um, heritage protection regimes that will save the taxpayer some money. The biggest excavation we've um, 
we've worked on so far. And the project's only been running since September last year, so it's in, still in fairly early days, been going for about a year, um, was what we call Exercise Beowulf. Um, this is the excavation of a Bronze Age round barrow, um, which is also the main residence of a large number of badgers, and also the place of an Anglo-Saxon cemetery. Um, I would get regular phone calls from my uh, partner company saying, there's bits of human bone on the surface, um, what do you want me to do about it? Well, it's, it's something that's untenable for me as an archaeologist to have curator, curatorially, to have a site with human remains lying on the surface. We've tried to exclude badgers from the site with badger-proof fencing. The badgers out with me every time, so um, I'm never going to win that one, especially as there's some local person that keeps cutting the fence and letting it back in. Um, so a pragmatic decision was made on consultation with English Heritage um, is that we would actually excavate the site. It's a site about uh, probably about five miles north of Stonehenge, um, outside the World Heritage Site, but nonetheless um, very important. And it was looked at in the 19th century by Colonel William Hawley, also, as you probably know, excavated Stonehenge. His records were pretty much on a par with the chap who had sent the letter and Carl went. Um, he even admitted that his records were even for him were poor. Um, so we decided we would investigate this site, get all the archaeological material, and take it away from being at risk. But at this point, I'm going to hand over to a participant of the project so he can tell you all about what we did. Thank you, Richard. Um, as uh, I've been introduced, I'm David Hart. I'm a former lance corporal with uh, six rifles, which was one of the T8 battalions, uh, which was formed on the, uh, the formation of the rifle in 2007. So uh, having been a bit of a mudblood myself, as uh, being not quite civilian, not quite soldier, somewhere in between, um, I was really keen to sort of do my part, and uh, I volunteered to go to Afghanistan in 2003. Um, unfortunately, I was uh, injured in January of 2004 in a vehicle-borne suicide attack, which resulted in the death of a comrade and injuries for myself and several other colleagues. So the big question for me is what to do, really. Um, my civilian life, as I knew it, had changed irrecoverably, and uh, couldn't go back to my day job as a forklift driver for a brewery. So I turned to education and went on to do a degree. Um, and uh, yeah, poor scorn on myself for optics, politics, and history rather than archaeology. So, uh, sort of fast forward really eight years. Um, I was in the final throes of a PGC uh, in July. So I'm now a fully qualified primary teacher for my sins. And um, I had an email from the rifles who uh, cared for casualties, uh, one of the publications there. Um, and just coming under the umbrella of the rifles for six months before I was medically discharged, uh, I was you know, lucky enough to be a recipient of one of their care grants who paid my tuition fees. What I also received that week, though, was um, an email telling me about this Operation Nightingale. Now, I saw the word archaeology straight away. My ears picked up, and uh, I was quite keen to see what this was about. But um, having been out for some five years, I assumed that, you know, there might be a few problems here. But uh, again, I, you know, I got a phone call, and I was welcomed up to the site. Unfortunately, because of my course ending, uh, when it did, I was only able to go for the, sort of, the last three weeks of exercise available up in the club. Um, which, you know, for me was great because I considered that the glory weeks because that's when all the fines were happening. Um, unfortunately for some of the four rifles lads, they'd essentially gone up and dug holes. Um, I think, yeah, the only trepidation I had really was, you know, when I, I spoke on the phone and said, so, you want me to go on soldiery play and dig holes for three weeks? Like, yes. So, well, having done that before, um, my one question was, you know, do I have to sleep in them? To which the answer was no, so I was like, right, I'm all in. And for rather selfish reasons as well, um, being that I specialise in humanities, uh, Anglo-Saxons is currently on curriculum, it was a real sort of dead spot for me and my knowledge. So I figured, do you know what, what the kids won't appreciate is me sort of bumbling my way through and my knowledge being not what it is. But I can amaze with the Anglo-Saxon skeletons that I dug up. So, uh, yeah, having come onto the site quite late, I, you know, straight away, my sort of trepidation was stripped away. It's, uh, in fact, it's quite scary for me how easily I slipped back into the squatty skin. You know, I, there I was, having been uh, reintroduced to society and become, you know, for all, all intents, a normal human being again. <laughs> I quickly found that I slipped into my squatty skin, and it was great. Um, as I previously mentioned, not being, not feeling fully a rifleman because I was only there for sort of seven months wearing that cap badge. Um, to integrate the guys from the other battalions and 
it was that real kind of rifles family thing, and that's the ethos that the rifles have strived for since their formation. And that felt really good, actually. But more importantly, the chance to do some archaeology. Um, straight away, I had a look around the site and was amazed. You know, it, it was double take on some of the skeletons, especially this one you see on the right, that Rifle and Kendrick was um, working. Uh, if you look to the left of the skull there, you can see this vessel, which is in the, the other picture there, having been cleaned up and preserved. Um, this was an Iron Age vessel, um, it was kind of a starfinder at that point. Uh, bearing in mind that guys are getting rather blase, you know, it's a case of the chat over lunch was, oh, I found another shield boss today. Um, you know, it was, it was not wasted on us really, that, you know, we were exceptionally lucky to be given a chance to excavate a site like this. And um, for me, it was the first time, you know, I, I felt that most of the guys, having done, you know, one or two digs, were pretty much professional by that point. Um, I suppose the benefits for me, uh, you know, as I've explained, they, they were great, but speaking to the other guys, some of the sort of junior riflemen, um, they were, you know, equally as scared about the fact that, you know, going on soldiers and digging holes, but their, you know, their reticence to, to do it was, you know, it seemed to disappear in an instant. And for all intents, you know, it's hard to distinguish, perhaps apart from the uniforms and the t-shirts, who were the archaeological students and who were the soldiers. Um, there were some particularly good finds, uh, on the left hand corner there was a roach, I think, was that the end? So it's, a, it's a sixth century Anglo Saxon part of the roach, which is too gilded. And uh, yeah, that was one of the uh, great finds there. Uh, that, I didn't actually put that in myself, that's not an attempt at glory. <laughs> that's me pretending that I know what I'm doing. Uh, unfortunately for me, I seem to end up on the grave cuts with no finds. But, uh, you know, I'm saving myself. You have Rifle McKendrick with his bucket and uh, Cooper Thompson with uh, Cooper Winston with his uh, find as well. So, um, you know, it, it came to a bit of a one-upmanship on the running tally, which tally I found what. But uh, I was quite happy to, to learn to record and after spending the best part of a year in the classroom, either sat there listening or being in front of it, you know, it's quite keen to get back to basics. And I felt as an infantier, it really came to me, I had almost an epiphanal moment, and I thought, well actually, in 13 years I spent wearing a uniform as an infantier. My bread and butter, as it were, was to know the ground, to appreciate the ground, and to assess it. And some of these skills came back to me really well, and I was quite surprised at myself, you know. I was looking uh, with a quite informed eye, and I thought, well, can I surely transfer these skills to archaeology? Um, again, that's something that I'll, it's a bit of a work in progress, but I was quite happy to start where I did, and I think actually coming from a site like Barrack Club, I was exceptionally spoiled. Um, whilst we were on the dig, and uh, in fact the, the day after I turned up, some of the guys were supposed to work, Richard included, and Dermot Walsh, uh, or Winston, who are either side of the award there, um, what happened was the British Archaeological Society had to essentially invent category so that they can offer, give them an award to Operation Nightingale for all its work, which um, I think is a great accolade, and especially when you think that Op Nightingale has only been going for just about 12 months this month, actually. Um, <coughs> what I would uh, just like to say is that all these sponsors and supporters have been able to make Operation Nightingale a feasible thing to do, and I think actually the benefits that everyone that I've spoken to and I myself have got out of the project so far uh, untold really. And I think, it, again, it's kind of giving soldiers a focus. There's certainly a lot in the press at the moment. And, uh, we're all quite aware that potentially after 2014, when I draw down from Afghanistan, there may be more drop from the headlines. But that may be the case. However, at the moment, what you do have is a lot of injured sold, um, service men and women who are trying to rebuild their lives and perhaps looking in different ways. And even if archaeology is perhaps not something that they take up future. I think the weeks they spend there are a great experience where they're immersed in something and their eyes are open to something different than you. So with that I'm just going to hand you back to Bridget. Thank you. Um, with the Barrow Clumps I just say that what was that? Uh, I say we did spoil David now that now you turn up the glory weeks you're uh, you're on the, the site stripping next year. Um, the fact is we, we found 27 Anglo-Saxon skeletons at uh, the cremation the skeletons were 6th century in date, um, a mixture of males, females and children, 
with some wonderful brave goods. Um, Dave mentioned that the shield bosses, we had three shield bosses, I think we had five spheres, some bladed weapons, um, lots of beautiful uh, brooches and beads. Now, if you try and put a, a rifleman on a body with brooches and beads, instead of one with drinking vessels, spears, shields, you're on a loser. Um, you've got that warrior to warrior connection ethos again, and um, yes, you're never going to succeed with that. The critical thing with that for us is that to, to give to give these, these young men a, a good experience. Um, we, we've chosen sites that will have rich archaeology uh, because that's important. None of them want to dig Bronze Age linear ditches, um, which are just going to be digging chalk because they've done that as part of their training job. Not digging ditches, Bronze Age ones anyway. No. Um, so giving them sites in the open air amongst good company with fresh rations, and you have to credit Care for Casualties Huge, you provided us with enough money. So you look at any for some to, to be able to get fresh rations for them and to be in the open air and for them to be able to discuss their experiences in a, in a kinship group that perhaps they've never been able to do that before. Now, as, as Dave said, archaeology may not be the solution for them, but maybe it's the start of opening their eyes that they have skill sets, they have transferable abilities. Um, some of them may go into archaeology. We've got at least three of them doing archaeology degrees at Leicester, having left school at 16 with no GCSEs and now doing degrees. Um, so for them, archaeology is certainly a means to an end and they can see that there is a future for them whether they stay in the army or whether they have to leave. Perhaps the most powerful thing in closing is um, one of the statements from one of the, the young rifles um, soldiers to me at the end of one of the projects when we asked him how, how it had been for him and he said it's the first time he'd slept properly in about six months post Afghanistan. And if nothing else, if archaeology as a, as a a discipline is able to give somebody that sort of experience. I think it's a, it's a very powerful.